Hi, welcome to valuationpodcast.com, a podcast and video series about all things related to business and valuation. My name is Melissa Gregg, and I provide online divorce mediation and valuation services in St. Louis, Missouri. Today, we will discuss the unimpeachable rebuttal with C. Zachary Myers, a CVA and CPA in Winfield, West Virginia. He is a testifying expert and has been qualified as an expert in the forensic accounting, taxation, business valuation, and pension valuation fields, specifically in civil, marital, and criminal litigation. You've kind of talked about some of those things, like what stands out in a neutral report that, and compare it to something that comes outside of the professional standards, because professional standards are a place that attorneys always want to go. So what would look different? Like where would they see something that um, was different than violating the standards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, attorneys do always try to go to that, you know, try to be the, the chair of the standards board and be on the stand. And the best thing they could possibly do is to say that you didn't follow standards. So, yes, they try to attack that. Um, I would make a point that I wanted to interject, but I wanted to let you finish what you were saying earlier because it was, it was right on point. You have to kill them with kindness. Mm-hmm. They will try their best to get you to be upset, to look irrational. To look emotional, um, sort of, you know, the first instance of controlling yourself is in the reports, first and foremost, in the, your, the way that you handle rebuttal or rebut yourself, uh, the way that you handle in a deposition is also one of the first sort of, um, for lack of a better word, trial and error, where they try to see what, how you react whenever they ask you a question a certain type of way, or whenever they attack your credibility, or whether they say something or, uh, you know, one of the best techniques that attorneys use is you, they'll ask you a question in a deposition, and then you'll say your answer, and they'll just look at you like, that's not, you're not answering my question. When you just did answer the question fully <laughs> and honestly. Um, and so you have to learn to sort of control yourself. But in a neutral, in a neutral report, uh, effectively, what you do is you kind of mitigate some of that because you're not only taking, and this is especially true in a damages case when you're, you could literally in a worst case scenario, uh, I see people are advocates either pushing the damage numbers up or down. Okay. And that's not going to work. I mean, it may work and there's some people that try to make a good living off of that, but uh, over time, that's just going to get you in trouble. Um, So you want to try to be neutral, have, you know, consideration of as of as many of the factors that, that you can and the known or knowable possible scenarios that could occur and not completely just discredit some some particular scenario just because your attorney told you to. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also give credence to in a deposition, for example, when they ask you about an alternative way to calculate something instead of saying, well, no, that way is stupid. You can basically say, well, yeah, there's, you could do it that way. And that's another generally accepted uh, way of doing whatever it is you're doing. Um, but this is the way that I do it. And I feel that this is, you know, the most reliable way that I can reliably apply this methodology and so on and so forth. So you're really sort of picking up the way you've done something and boosting, you know, supporting your points and your opinions without necessarily saying the disingenuous stuff like, oh, well, yeah, he's made an error. He's done. Yeah, he can't do that. That, That's never done when it's clearly something that some experts may take a position and may adopt a alternative methodology to yours. Um, But, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, for me, facilitating the trier of fact with being able to understand the facts and evidence is one of the best characteristics in a neutral report. So your presentation, words you use, you know, not being inflammatory, being unimpeachably neutral, those things add a certain level of quality that most judges will appreciate. Um, And I think some people have been playing on the sort of time crunch and hoping that, oh, well, the judge is not going to read this. This judge's docket is so backed up. And they just try to use inflammatory things and words in the reports or in testimony hoping that someone wasn't paying attention or that the clerk, the judge's clerk, who oftentimes is the one that will read the reports first, doesn't pick up on something. Right. 
Right. And, and I think that, you know, in a lot of these situations, um, you know, recently I was on the stand and then they said, well, could you make an assumption of what the earnings were between the date of marriage and, and, and when this money came in? And I was like, well, judge, I don't have to make an assumption. So I always, I get asked the questions from the attorney and then I talk to the judge. Right. And so I say, judge, I don't have to make those assumptions because I, I actually reviewed the statements and I can tell you exactly how much those accounts made. And the attorney was like, well, but, but I just want you to tell me like what hypothetically it could have made. And I was like, yeah, but I don't have, I, I don't have to hypothetically guess we have the documents judge. Like if we want to pull them up, we could certainly pull them up. And again, you know, I could certainly respond to him in a very snarky manner and I could, and I could imply that he doesn't know because, you know, a strategy with an attorney is to showcase when they don't know something because attorneys always, you know, and, and it is, but I don't think it's a really good strategy because then it's sort of like you literally poked the bear and now they're going to come for you, which is, I mean, everything is, is useful in its own time. Um, but I think it's, it's making those assumptions. It's also concessions, you know, like I'll tell the attorney going into a deposition. I was like, you know, they have a kind of a point on this one area, but I said, there's no definitive guidance on it. And so they're taking a position. I'm taking a position, quite frankly, the valuation community is on each side. So I'm going to testify to that. And so if they asked me, well, could that person be right? Or could you be right? And I would say, well, you know, quite frankly, the valuation community is divided. And these are the reasons why I think that this position makes sense. And, and quite frankly, we've talked about this before. Judges rely on logic. Like you can present all the best data, but again, if you want to say that this cup of coffee is worth a million dollars, you're going to have to give me more than that. This is a cup of coffee, right? You know, so I think that the judge would be like, well, that doesn't make sense. So then we have to layer it with the information, the fact pattern, the, all of these types of things. So I think that, you know, this is nuanced stuff. I totally get it. But it's also information that I think I would have wanted to know. You know, when we, we, we always talked about, okay, make sure, I, I don't know, it, it almost seems superfluous, the things that we talked about of how to be a good expert as I've like gone through my career. You know, I've had to learn a lot of these things um, by seeing other experts do it that didn't work it backfired or something.